Did you know that the last guillotine execution took place as recently as 1977? Chilling, isn't it? In the grand scheme of history, this date is but a blink of the eye away. It's a stark reminder that the guillotine, an instrument associated with the distant past, has a more recent presence in our historical timeline than many would dare to imagine. Now let's wind back the clock a little further, to a time of revolution and radical change. The late 18th century, the time of the French Revolution. This was the period that bore the guillotine, a creation that was ironically intended to be a more humane method of execution. Yes, you heard right. Humane. Dr. Joseph Ignace Guillotin, a French physician, proposed this device with the belief that it would make capital punishment less painful. His idea was that swift and sure was better than slow and agonizing. The guillotine, with its heavy, angled blade, was designed to decapitate the victim quickly and, in theory, painlessly. And so, in a twisted turn of events, the guillotine was born out of a desire for kindness. A desire to bring equality in death, to make the end swift and painless, irrespective of class or status. A noble thought, perhaps, but one that led to a device that would become a symbol of terror and bloodshed. From its first official use in 1792, the guillotine quickly became the primary method of execution during the Reign of Terror. Its blade fell on the necks of thousands, from common criminals to aristocrats and revolutionaries alike. Its efficiency and the spectacle it created made it a terrifying tool of justice and control. But the guillotine is more than just a historical relic. It's a symbol, a reflection of the times in which it was created and used. It's a reminder of humanity's capacity for cruelty, even in the pursuit of justice and equality. Now that we've set the stage, it's time to delve into some of the more unsettling aspects of this device. The guillotine was disturbingly efficient, wasn't it? A chilling testament to human ingenuity, it was designed with one purpose in mind, to execute as swiftly and painlessly as possible. This it achieved with a grim consistency that still sends shivers down our spines. The guillotine's design was deceptively simple. A tall, upright frame, a heavy, angled blade, a quick release mechanism, all combined to create a machine of chilling precision. The blade, falling from a height of about four meters, could reach speeds of up to 20 kilometers per hour. Its sharpness and the sheer force of its descent ensured that the cut was clean, severing the neck in a fraction of a second. But this was more than just a machine. It was a symbol, an instrument of the French Revolution's reign of terror. From the spring of 1793 to the summer of 1794, it claimed the lives of over 16,000 people. Nobles, clergy, revolutionaries, commoners, the guillotine was an egalitarian executioner, indifferent to rank or status. Yet the guillotine's efficiency was a double-edged sword. Its speed and precision made it a preferred method of execution, but they also contributed to its terrifying reputation. The swift, seemingly painless death it offered was a stark contrast to the prolonged suffering of older methods. This made the guillotine a paradox, a humane killing machine. What's more, the guillotine's efficiency allowed for mass executions, a grim spectacle that gathered crowds of onlookers. This public display served to intimidate, to showcase the power of the state over the individual. But it also desensitized people to the act of killing, turning a gruesome spectacle into a mundane, everyday event. And so, the guillotine became an embodiment of the reign of terror, swift, merciless, and chillingly efficient. It was a machine designed to kill, and it did so with a grim regularity that marked one of the darkest periods in French history. But the guillotine's efficiency wasn't its only disturbing feature. Its legacy, its impact on the collective consciousness and the questions it raises about the nature of death and punishment are equally unsettling. These are stories for another time. Public executions were once grand spectacles with the guillotine as the star. Imagine a time when death was not hidden away but displayed openly on the streets. The guillotine, a cold mechanical instrument of death, was not just a tool for execution. It was a spectacle that drew in the masses, a form of theater that played out on the public stage. The guillotine's sinister silhouette would rise against the skyline, a stark reminder of the power of the state. As the crowd gathered, a palpable sense of anticipation would fill the air. It was a gruesome form of entertainment, but also a stark warning. You see, the guillotine was not just about punishment, 
it was also about control. As the condemned were led to the scaffold, their faces would reflect a range of emotions. Some showed defiance, others resignation, and a few even a certain grim acceptance. But all were aware that they were the unwilling actors in a chilling drama that was about to unfold. The crowd, too, played a role in this spectacle. They were not just passive observers, but active participants. They would cheer, boo, jeer, or even weep, their reactions as varied as the faces in the crowd. Some came to revel in the gory spectacle, others to show solidarity with the condemned, and a few perhaps to confront their own fears of mortality. This was the spectacle of death in its rawest form. It was a spectacle that served a dual purpose, to entertain and to intimidate. It was a stark reminder of the power of the state and a chilling warning to those who might dare to defy it. In this way, the guillotine was more than just a machine. It was a symbol, a powerful and terrifying embodiment of the state's power over life and death. It was a spectacle that struck fear into the hearts of the condemned and the spectators alike, a spectacle that left an indelible mark on the collective consciousness. The guillotine was more than a machine. It was a symbol of power and fear. What happens when the blade falls? The science may surprise you. The guillotine, with its sharp, swift blade, was designed for one purpose, to sever the human head from its body. But what happens in those moments after the blade's deadly descent? The answer lies in the intersection of medicine and macabre. You might have heard stories of severed heads blinking or mouths moving post-beheading. These tales, as ghastly as they sound, have a foundation in science. The human brain can continue to function for a few moments after decapitation due to residual oxygen in the blood. This could potentially lead to fleeting moments of consciousness. Such phenomena were observed by physicians and executioners alike. One such anecdote involves a French physician named Dr. Bourrieu, who in the late 19th century conducted an experiment on the severed head of a guillotined criminal. He called the victim's name and reportedly saw the eyelids slowly lift up without any sign of fluttering. The eyes met his with a look of life before fading away after a few seconds. However, these observations are highly contentious. Neuroscientists argue that while the brain might indeed live on for a few seconds, consciousness is another matter entirely. The shock of beheading would likely cause immediate unconsciousness. This is due to the rapid drop in blood pressure that follows decapitation, causing the brain to shut down almost instantly. The movements observed in severed heads are likely involuntary muscle spasms rather than conscious actions. While these discussions might seem macabre, they have contributed significantly to our understanding of consciousness and brain function. They've also raised ethical questions about the humanity of execution methods, leading to reforms and changes in laws around the world. The guillotine, in its cold efficiency, has not only left a mark on history, but also nudged forward the frontiers of science. It stands as a stark reminder of the thin line that separates life from death and the fleeting nature of consciousness. The guillotine story is a chilling mix of science, spectacle and death. The guillotine has left a lasting legacy, hasn't it? This fearsome device, once a symbol of swift justice in a turbulent time, has carved its place deep into our collective consciousness. Its blade has sliced through the fabric of history, influencing literature, film and even political discourse. In the world of literature, the guillotine has been the macabre muse of many a writer. From Charles Dickens' A Tale of Two Cities to Hilary Mantle's A Place of Greater Safety, the guillotine serves as a chilling backdrop to tales of love, loss and revolution. It's a symbol of the tumultuous times that inspired these stories. A stark reminder of the price of freedom and the cost of tyranny. Moving on from the written word, the guillotine has also found its way onto the silver screen. It's been featured in films from the early days of cinema to the present day, from the silent horror classic The Man Who Laughs to the dystopian drama The Hunger Games. The guillotine, with its stark, brutal simplicity, lends itself well to visual storytelling, providing a potent symbol of fear, power and inevitability. Beyond its role in the arts, the guillotine has also been used as a symbol in political protests. From the French Revolution to modern-day demonstrations, it's been a powerful emblem of the people's demand for justice and equality, a stark reminder of what can happen when those in power forget who they serve. And of course, there's the ongoing debate about the ethics of capital punishment. The guillotine, once seen as a mercifully quick method of execution, 
is now viewed by many as a brutal relic of a bygone era. Yet it continues to fuel discussions about the morality of state-sanctioned killing, about justice and vengeance, about humanity and inhumanity. From its creation to its last use in 1977, the guillotine has been a chilling testament to humanity's capacity for both innovation and cruelty.